So you're all wondering why we're sitting here, right? Why you guys are sitting here, why you're tuned in. Um, we are going to discuss why attribution could be killing your strategy, which is somewhat of a controversial topic. Most of our clients hire us to drive results for them and not only drive results for them, but to show them what's working, what's not working. And obviously return on ad spend is a huge deal, um, but we want to maybe have here as an open discussion about um, the broader look at what you're doing with your, with your marketing and, and kind of how it all fits together. So I'm going to work as the host as well too. First timer here. So maybe this is the future for me, right? Come on down. We might have a few game shows for you. So if those are in the audience here, I'm just kidding, we won't. So we're going to get kicked off with some questions here. I got all these questions here and let's start the first one right here with, with Eric. Um, what is your current favorite non fortune 500 brand and why? Technically, uh, the NBA is not a fortune 500 company. And so they're probably my favorite, but my favorite new company is, um, Gab wireless actually. Um, we just started using Gab this year with our kids and their product, what they do, their purpose, their mission, everything about Gab is, has been like awesome. I, I love learning about who they are and what they do for the community. Great. I, in fact, I would like everyone to answer this one. So Artie, what's your current favorite? Maybe that'd be like non Fortune 500, but just maybe it less known brand. Definitely is a non Fortune 500. My favorite is Snowbird. Okay. And this has nothing to do with my recreational activities. It has everything to do with their billboard campaigns. They crack me up. They're perfectly positioned. Um, I don't know if you've seen them, but it's like a one-star review. And it says, too much powder. Too much powder. It was too difficult. And they're catering exactly the to the type of person they want on that mountain, putting it right where it needs to be. I love it. So I, I, I'm with you there. Not only is it have like funny things, but on, on that one specifically about the too much powder one, no offense to someone in here is from Texas, but it has the person, it's like a reviewer from Texas, which like if you grow up in Utah and it's all about like, oh, the skier from Texas is what you dread. So I'm with you, that's hilarious. What about you, Jared? Um, I'd have to say a few actually, I don't know, it depends. And a few for different reasons, like for branding, um, I really like what's happening over at, at, at Numi Tees. And, okay. and Olipop Soda, I think, is really killing it right now. In fact, they've, they've been able to grow primarily on the back of their branding. Um, I think customer service, actually, Chewy is killing it right now. Yeah. And, and uh, you're seeing all sorts of stories about things like my dog died, and I, I call it contact to Chewy to see if I can get a refund on the dog food I just purchased. <laughs> Did you see and that on LinkedIn? On what? On LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few of those, right, where they said they're, they're not only refunding, but you know, sending them flowers for the yeah, dog. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're just killing it. Um, and then I, I think Lululemon's also doing quite well with the branding. I think they're, they're doing well in their marketing as well. Yeah. Right. I, maybe I'll answer the question as well too. Mine falls in that line with Lululemon, but there's a, there's a kind of a athletic apparel brand called ASRV that I've just been obsessed with. And for me, it's just like the quality of the stuff they make and all that kind of stuff. So the reason why I wanted to have this question be a part of it is, is if you notice, everyone's obviously um, favorite brands were different. And the reasons why we're all a little bit different, but not a single person was up here and was said, hey, I really like this company because their performance marketing strategy is just dialed in, right? And so this brings up the broader kind of view of, you know, there's a lot more to your marketing than right, just the performance driven stuff, right? There's things you got to do to influence brand. There's things you got to do to influence perception. There's things you got to do to do that. And a lot of those things might not drive the ROAS that we want them to, right? But sounds like we shouldn't abandon those because they're they're making people talk. So um, moving along, speaking of ROAS campaigns, and we'll we'll send this one over to Jared. So how do you determine the success of your non-ROAS driven campaign? So so we're talking about the importance of them. How do you how are yeah. they successful? No, that's a good question. Um, primarily, we're driving it through through results, right? Whether that's conversions, add to carts, clicks, right? We're we're a, a B 2 C company, and so. So that's primarily what we're looking at. But for us as a whole, that ROAS issue is, has been a big issue, um, primarily because, uh, and maybe this is sidetracking a little bit, but I feel like we're getting back to pre-2013 marketing where there really needs to be a top of funnel and, and a separate bottom of funnel um, marketing budget. You know? and, and I think people have forgotten how to do that. We got so tied into primarily Facebook and what it was kicking off 
and, and that immediate response, and it just kept getting more and more immediate, that we totally left out brand building. We totally forgot how to, how to do long-term marketing. And that long-term marketing was kicked back in. So for us, we're looking at those long-term markers. And that primarily is things like results, trademark term impressions, are people talking about us? Are they actually accomplishing the, the results along the, along the path that we want them to, to complete? Even Absolutely. if that's gonna be, they're gonna be a customer a year down the road, you know? Any, anyone else have any thoughts on that one? How to, how to, you know, how to judge the success, the success of those? Let's go with Artie, let's go with Artie. <laughs> Yeah, so we like to kind of measure brand lift. So we'll look at, um, you know, an event that we go to or um, bidding on Gartner properties, which can get very expensive. But you also see a correlating increase in organic traffic, organic leads, direct traffic, yep, direct well. leads. Um, and you can't really tie it back to, okay, first they saw us over here, they saw us at the event, saw our booth, and then googled us like you can't really do that but when covid took away events we definitely saw all of that traffic decrease by like 20 percent yeah and i see the same thing with webinars where you can't correlate directly the impact and the value of certain like events and webinars but you can see the uplift of organic especially and google search when you do events and so you see for the b2b market um we look at opportunities and are we generating more opportunities because of a holistic approach to marketing and and if that opportunity number is increasing then the impact is felt by all the different channels that you're doing so i'll maybe answer that a little bit too and jerry brought up an important thing that we try to discuss with our clients is is grouped budgets, right? So you mentioned that as like, maybe you have a budget for your ROAS campaigns and then another budget for your non-ROAS campaigns. And that's important because you can't judge those against each other, right? Because what would be the, the, the judge if it's the results? Well then yeah, your ROAS campaigns are gonna do better, but you're gonna kill your top of funnel customers, right? Um, we do the same thing for our clients too that, that already mentioned is we'll try to like, maybe make an annotation in Google Analytics or somewhere that says, okay, we did this event or we launched this display campaign or we launched this big video campaign on these dates in this market. Let's see if we can track a lift in, in direct and organic traffic to the website from those areas, right? You might not be able to track it directly to which ad it was or what placement it was, what publisher it was with, but you definitely can kind of get a sense of, well, there was a 15% lift and those can kind of be some of the ways that you can judge the success of a non-ROAS driven campaign. And ROAS for everybody, return on ad spend for anybody that doesn't know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because starting out back to 2013, it was all ROI. And then all of a sudden, Facebook decided to create this ROAS that everyone now uses as this common truth. But before I never heard of it growing up, it was all ROI. Now it's ROAS. But thanks for explaining that. Speaking of ROAS, are non ROAS objectives effective at driving bottom line revenue growth? Are non-ROAS objectives effective at driving bottom line growth? Yeah, 100%. Okay. Like uh, 100%. And, and, and uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit of, of like, well, let me just give a little background on that. Uh, you know, iOS 14, anybody who's, who's direct consumer understands yeah. what, yeah. what happened there. It's a bad word around the office. It's so a bad word, that. right? Um, and that's because we've gotten so good at just being like, well, we'll just give Facebook our money. The algorithm works. Like it kicks it back. It's immediate. And, and what we saw, or what we're seeing is that any businesses that, that weren't involved in separating that out and really focusing on that long-term campaign or top of funnel campaign before that really took hits. And the way that they're seeing it is this constant decline in their customers or it's, or it's extremely volatile, right? And they can't figure out what is happening. Um, and that's because what they're seeing is the results of last year's efforts, pre iOS 14 efforts. If they were building those new customers and building that, that pool, then they're actually seeing growth through this. And luckily, uh, we kind of caught on a little early and we, we're, seeing, we're seeing immense growth this year and it's just this constant line up. But a big part of that is because of our non ROAS stuff. Right. One of the things that we switched to was not only a, a segmented budget, but we actually switched to non-conversion campaigns. And and one of the ones that's been really helpful for us is our add to cart campaign. Right. Just driving straight to add to carts and letting the algorithm kind of compile that. And so we went from having roughly 3000 new customers a month to over 10,000 customers wow. a month. And it's 
And it's all attributable to that add to cart campaign. We can look at it through things like trademark term impressions or, or organic search. Um, we can find it other ways and see, see the way that it's working. But it's just a long-term play that since iOS 14, you can't do in, in a simple algorithm. You have to actually get back to thinking about it. Absolutely. Go ahead, Eric. I was going to say, it's interesting to look at the perspective of B2C versus like B2B, because right now, I, at least uh, in a few companies that I've helped with in the last few years, Facebook has had impact, but it's been going down like further and further on the Facebook side. Um, but with Google, um, we've stayed really steady um, with what we're doing in the conversion rates and the attribution um, with Google. And, but we're not gonna just like get rid of Facebook, um, even if it's not working, because there's an uplift like we were talking about when we do a little bit more in Facebook, it has a direct impact on our Google campaigns because of the exposure and the branding that we're getting across multiple channels. And so Facebook for us is our non-ROAS um, um, type of campaigns. And whereas Google is our ROAS focused campaigns. Yeah, I would say, I would say to add on what you're saying, uh, another big thing that we've seen happen is that it used to be that people were interacting on social media or with ads and, and, and you'd have that immediate click. Right, so the ROAS was easy to track, but you have to realize that social media as a whole and marketing as a whole has moved from, hey, buy to let me entertain you. And as an entertainment space, people are gonna watch that, whether it's on YouTube, they're gonna keep watching what they were watching. If it's on Facebook, they're gonna keep scrolling where they were scrolling. If it's on TikTok, they're gonna notice that and keep scrolling, and then they're gonna search you later. So it's all coming back because they're like, not now, I'll remember it. I might even save you. I might even click and come back later, but it's going to be, it's not an immediate ROAS thing. Right. And so it's because marketing has shifted mm -hmm. and, and immensely in the last couple of years. So, so a couple of things too on, on that I want to, I want to touch on is, is two things with this whole, this whole idea of attributions killing your strategy is, is number one is kind of the inception of this idea for me was like sitting down and like beating my head against the wall of like, we'd set up these campaigns that we thought were good ideas, right? We're getting like addressable OTT campaigns. We're like, we know addresses of people who are going to buy a car and we're delivering with over the top ads, right? And you, you know, as a marketer, that's a good idea, right? You know, it's going to influence them and all that. And then you run it and you track it and you just, it doesn't track, right? The results in, in analytics or whatever attribution platform you are, just don't, they don't look good. And so, so it, it I look at it going, does that mean we shouldn't run those? Or does that mean we should look at them differently, right? Put them into a different bucket, track them, analyze them a different way. And then the second thing is, is when we talk about like non-ROAS campaigns, by no means are any of us up here sitting, saying we're not going to track things. Or you're just going to throw a video campaign out there and not care what it does. What I like what you said, Jared, was like you had a non-ROAS campaign that was all about adding the cart, but yet you saw it drive like bottom line. You know, increase the bottom line for your business and that that was kind of that thing is like as a marketer if you if you feel like something is a good idea go with your gut right don't let attribution kill your strategy because it might not uh, look good in analytics so more or less that's what i wanted to discuss as a big picture so we, we we're talking a lot about the difference between ROAS and non-ROAS stuff so does your content strategy need to differ between ROAS and non-ROAS driven campaigns and i already want you to take this one yes it Absolutely does. So we do a lot of thought leadership, very lengthy white papers that I can barely finish. <laughs> Our audience is legal professionals. They love to read. Um, they love to read really long, dense things. Um, and that really, really works. It gets uh, people interested. It creates a little bit of brand affinity for us and they keep coming back or seeing us as these curators of content um, that matters to them. It doesn't really matter to me. I don't really care about security in your law firm case management system. That's very dense for me and I'm not very interested. But I do know those campaigns get people in the door. Do they turn into sales within a month? Definitely not, um, unless maybe we incentivize them. And I think one of the things you have to consider with your content strategy for those types of things is a very strong nurture process. Um, with the right nurture, you can turn any non-ROAS activity into a ROAS activity. You just have to know how to find them. And 
have to stay very organized with what you started with and where you want them to end up. And I think it's not just non-ROAS versus ROAS. It, it really is what kind of you started with, which is top, middle, and bottom of the funnel um, tactics, where um, you're going to apply that same content for top, middle, and bottom to both ROAS and non-ROAS campaigns. Um, and but it, like I loved what you said, where you can turn non-ROAS um, type of campaigns into ROAS activities down the road through nurture. That, that, that's brilliant. I, I kind of have to laugh at this question because when you look at it, like, did your content need to differ between ROAS or non-ROAS? And it's like, your content needs to differ almost every touch point, right? I mean, not only do you need to segment on where they're at in the customer journey, but what we pride ourselves in at Max and X is doing is segmenting every different audience, right? And speaking to them differently and speaking to in, inside those audiences, to people differently, depending on where they're at in the funnel. So uh, I can't remember whose quote it was, but they say, if you want to have a happy ending, it depends on where you end the story, right? So it's kind of that same thing. Well, if you want to have like non-ROAS campaigns turn into ROAS, well, it depends where you end your attribution tracking, right? Because if you ended it before you, they convert or they're higher funnel, you're going to feel like there's no ROAS. Well, if you keep tracking those people through the end of the story, well, it might turn out to be a higher ROAS. So any other questions on the creative differences or any other responses on that? Or Yeah. Uh, I, I think what you just said was is, is super important, you know, where are you end the story. I mean, you could even end it after the first purchase and it could be they never make a second purchase, yeah. right? They don't have a repeat purchase, could get a sad story. So, you know, keep going. But uh, as far as the content goes, yeah, it's got to be drastically different. And I think we all know that inherently, right? We would never walk up to somebody and say, hi, I'm Jared, would you buy my product? Right? Like first introductions, hey, how's it going? Bye, 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 please, bye, yeah. right? Somebody's like, are you kidding me? Get away from me. And, and yet somehow we've gotten that way in our marketing where we think that's what we have to do. And it's like, no, the non ROAS stuff and particularly the longer term plays really are back to that pre 2013 time where it's, it's brand acknowledgement, just well, brand awareness saying, Hey, we're out here. This is what we stand for. And I think even more now a days than ever, people don't want to interact with a company like a faceless company, right? Your company has to have a personality for has sure. to feel like it's a person. And in that way, they don't want to inter in, interact with the person who's just like, Hey, buy from me, buy from me, buy from me. It's what it's, here's what I believe. Here's how I'm trying to make the world. Absolutely. Better. Here's who and I to take that step further, yeah. that's what, one thing I always get so worried when clients want to put all their money into paid search because it's such a good ROAS driver and yeah. it drives results for them is like, you're now allowing the customer to dictate their opinion of your brand before you even give yourself to introduce yourself to them. Right. So like, imagine if that was how it worked in life, where it's like, before I even got to introduce you, you were already deciding the brand of me based on a some text you read about me, right? Like a text message about me. Yeah. You're not going to know who I am. Let me have a chance to introduce myself to you, get to know me first, and then you can, you know, have your brand perception of me. But it's the same thing with marketing. If you put all your money into paid search, well, you don't even give a chance to introduce yourself, your, your you know, perception, your imagery, what you stand for, you as a company before the customer already has, has made their opinion, right? And you're asking them to buy before you've even introduced yourself too. So that, when I think of that, I'm always like, that wouldn't work in the real world. Well, it's not going to work with customers either. Right. It's like sitting at a dinner party over in the corner, waiting for people to approach you yeah. and yeah. ask you what you do. Yeah. <laughs> We've all been there though. Yeah. You know? yeah. Sometimes you're just not in the mood. <laughs> Those right? are the days you just go home. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Come out. Um, okay. Moving along here. Um, what percentage of your marketing budget currently goes towards non ROAS objectives and what percentage should go towards non ROAS objectives? So what percentage you, you mentioned Jared about putting it in buckets. Anyone answer this? And what percentage do you feel like right now, goes to non-ROAS and what percentage do you feel like should? I'll go. Go ahead, Artie. <laughs> we spend 0% on non-ROAS. Um, <laughs> I would like there to be 15 to 20% on non-ROAS, um, but given just our hyper growth targets, that is where we are. We have very intense targets we have to meet every month and there's just no time to do the non-ROAS stuff. Um, we are communicating that we will need to do this at some point um, and hopefully that'll get launched. But um, when it comes to like, we're pretty early in our company life cycle um, and it's, we're repositioning our brand as we speak. So we don't even really have like the brand story to tell 
at this moment. So it's just kind of like, go, 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 bottom line. Um, new brand is being unveiled next quarter. <laughs> That's how that goes. Any other thoughts on that? I mean, we're, we're at about like 15 to maybe 20% non-ROAS. Um, I would love to be at like 30, 40, even 50% one day. And I think it really has to do with what stage of a company you're at, because each stage of a company is gonna have a different size of budget. And based off of that budget, you can only do so much with it. And, um, but you have to do both the short-term and long-term focus. And, and if we're not doing a little bit in those non-ROAS, it will affect us, maybe not right now or even this year, but it will affect us in a year or two years down the road even. Yeah, I agree. Like the more mature your company is, and I just mean in terms of like a company life cycle, yeah. the larger your non-ROAS spend is going to be. Look at Toyota. They have so many commercials on the Super Bowl. They're all different. They're all like the maximum amount of time it can be. Um, I'm very rarely targeted with like a search ad for Toyota. Maybe from a dealership, sure, but not Toyota themselves. I'd say you know, they've been around a lot. They have a lot of brand affinity, a lot of trust. Um, and so they can afford to just perpetuate their image. And they do a great job. And, and, and clearly what those OEMs have found, because they've found it to be, we, you know, we mentioned like, can non-ROAS campaigns drive bottom line? Well, all these OEMs have apparently felt like it has because every single car manufacturer's programs are the same. They have their tier one advertising, which is Toyota, Ford. It's the Super Bowl commercial. It's, it's the national stuff. They've got their tier two stuff, which is going to be their regional dealers. Mm -hmm. And then the tier three is the individual dealers. And each of those kind of advertises at a different part of the funnel, if you will. But cohesively, they all work together. And it kind of shows you that clearly like those, those car dealer brands feel like the top of funnel stuff is going to move the needle for them. And I think depending on the age of your company, what it is, it can have more effect than others, right? If Filevine had a big Super Bowl commercial, it's not gonna have the effect that Toyota would because it doesn't have the, the brand, it doesn't have the reach, right? So I think it also depends on what, like you said, the company you are, where you're at in it. Totally, and I think that's the type of advertising they do as well in, in that non-ROAS, right? Whether it's just getting out who we are, what we believe, helping us become more of a personality. You know, you see that a lot with your big ones, Apple, Nike, Toyota, For sure. things like that. For us, uh, we're not in that place by any means. Nobody knows who Keto Chow is, so we're still trying to just get our name out there. But we're at, we're at a different uh, percentage, I think. We're 70-30. We're 70, 30. Great. 70 for non-ROAS, 30 for ROAS. And, and, and I, I, with, I say that with the caveat of that 70, I'm also tracking a ROAS. It just happens to be six to nine months down the road. And we see a drastic like we can literally measure the effect of that six to nine months down the road and see how it's, how it's shifting. And so, so yeah, it's a longer term play, but we are, we're 70, 30. Yeah. You brought up an interesting point there too, because this is kind of this overall point I want to make from this, this panel is, is tracking the, the row as can drastically change. If you, if you change what the R is, right. Well, what are you trying to get returned back? If it's all sales, then yeah, then obviously you know what it is. But like the non-ROAS campaigns might be the return might be reach, right? It might be frequency. It might be customers to the website. It might be new, like newsletter signups. It might be add to carts. You know, they're going to be different stages of the funnel. And so part of it is like, where do you separate ROAS and non-ROAS? Because it's like, like you said, you're still tracking all that stuff. It's not like you're putting 70% of it in stuff that you don't care that happens. You absolutely care what happens and you're absolutely still tracking it. It's just of a different has a different model that you're comparing it against and maybe the super low funnel stuff. So speaking of tracking effectiveness, the question we have here is, how do you measure the effectiveness of the top of funnel digital channels, such as display, native advertising, and pre-roll? How do you know if they are driving consideration and ultimately increasing your market share? It's kind of the glory question, right? We want everyone to know. How do you do it, Eric? It's hard. Um, like tracking everything is, is really tough. It takes time. Um, it takes systems. It takes operations. Um, I mean, it, we we use HubSpot. Um, I'm, I'm a big HubSpot fan, and I do everything in there. Um, uh, we moved the entire org into HubSpot actually in the last uh, month, and we're just starting to build out our UTM structure. And so the UTM structure is the primary thing for any company. It doesn't matter if you're B2B, B2C, like you've got to be able to track every single campaign and everything you're doing. And so, um, so we use that as our foundation for our marketing and all of our data. And then 
we push it also into the Salesforce and we use, we use Domo we, and we've built our own um, analytic systems and, and different things in the past. And so there's a lot you have to do to get a really good attribution. So that way you can track back to your organic, to, to everything that you're trying to do. Um, for me, it honestly doesn't matter what you use or how you do it, as long as you do something. And, and you start somewhere and have a central area that you're always looking at to be able to see that data and make changes based off of that data. Yeah, I always say the recipe for success with digital marketing is the test, track, and optimize. Right. I mean, you mentioned a couple of tools and, and softwares and we use all of those same things. And I'm with you. It's like there's certain tools I like better than others. But at the end of the day, you really just need to have a plan in place and then like test against that plan and hold all the vendors and all the channels you're doing to the same thing. But is a test track and optimize. So any other, any other insights on how you measure that effectiveness of those you know, kind of top of funnel stuff? I mean, you want to define your objective pretty clearly Absolutely. and every ad platform is going to have some way to do that and like column customization. So you can really hone in on what metrics matter to you. Like maybe you care more about ad recall than you care about clicks. Great. So start measuring that. They let you do that. They have, a, I feel like every year they come out with more and more kind of like brand awareness metrics. Absolutely. Because there's only one way to count a conversion. Yeah. It happened or it didn't. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the fact that, you know, Google and Facebook and all these different platforms are pushing so hard to track these other things shows the importance of them, right? They know they're important and they know there's some pitfalls in the, in the attribution with some of the higher funnel channels. And so they're trying to do the same thing to be able to help marketers show the effectiveness of it. We measure brand lift a lot too through tracking things in analytics. So for us, like if we see increases in direct and organic traffic, that's a pretty good indicator for us. You know, obviously with video, we're looking at things like view rates because no one's going to click on them. So you want to track view rates for there. With display, a lot of it is like not only how many people they're bringing to the site directly, but did we see a lift in organic and direct traffic and where was that from and how long do those people stay and things like that too. But having a plan in place, I think is the most important thing. Um, here we go. Can you share an experience of where you invested a certain invested in a certain channel that didn't show immediate attribution or an ROI, but yet you were certain it was having an intended impact? So this goes back to like, even though the data wasn't there, your marketing gut was like, I know this is a good thing. Do we have an experience of that or something they can remember with that or? Yeah, so for B2B, we bid pretty heavily on um, Gartner property property. So that's your Captera software advice and get app. It's insanely expensive. The cost per lead is at least double, if not triple, what we would expect to see elsewhere. However, when we don't bid aggressively there, we see a huge decrease in organic and direct leads as well. So we know that people are going to Captera. They see us, they're like, oh, maybe I'll go check out Filevine's website, or maybe I'll just like click their link and then go there. Um, and we, we've run a few experiments where we turned it off and controlled for a bunch of other variables and the organic and direct leads went away <laughs> and we turned it back on and they popped right back up again. Um, so that's one of the B2B must haves, I would say, if you can pay to play, <laughs> it's expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jared? Yeah, I could, share, I, I could share too, one that worked, one that didn't work. Um, the one that didn't work first was we were trying some streaming, right? Uh, getting on Hulu and Peacock and Paramount. And, and uh, so what we did is we segmented it out into specific areas that we, we had a pretty steady number for the last several months. And then we dumped a bunch of, of, of streaming ads into that, into that specific geographic area and tracked it for about a month. And we, we put enough money behind it that it, it should have a, a pretty strong uh, return. And at the end of the month, it did have a decent return, but not what we needed it to have. And so we realized that's not going to work for us right now. So we turned that off. Um, another one that we tried was our add to cart campaign. Um, prior to iOS 14 and kind of seeing what that was probably going to do, well, that's when we started segmenting and really dumped into a, a campaign that was purely add to cart. Like, let's just get people who are ready to buy, but not quite. Um, and of course that had, had a, a decent role as, cause those are people it's driving yeah. towards people who are wanting to add the card anyways. But at the end of the day, um, it was a lot of money spent and it, it gets scary, particularly for the CFO. Right. 
and you have to kind of hold their hand and say, don't worry, like this is going to pan out. Just give us a few months. Like this is, this is we know this is going to happen. Here's what's going to do, you know? And it took probably four months of that uh, as we saw our add to carts grow and grow and grow. And the CFO was sweating and sweating and sweating <laughs> before finally it all started to pan out. And about month five, uh, everything started coming together and it just started to roll from there. And as we continued that campaign, it just kept rolling and rolling like a snowball. But it's that first four or five months where you're looking at it and everybody's saying, I don't think this is working because they've been stuck in this mode of we put the money in, we get the money out immediately. And it's not that way anymore. Um, one of the things we also noticed while doing that was that the Facebook algorithm in and of itself is shrinking everybody. Um, and and I, we can't find the proof of it, but it's pretty much in the numbers. Mm -hmm. You can tell it's happening. As it's searching for those conversions people and people that are going to convert immediately, it's only grabbing those people who are gonna convert within that first, their, their window, their small, small window now. And it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you're seeing these companies dump all this money in this conversion. No, we got to put more money in there to get more. And it's just less and less people. Yep. So they're seeing it go like this and they're dumping more and more money and they're going, what's going on? Well, that's what's happening. Sounds like attribution's killing their strategy. Attribution's killing your strategy. <laughs> yeah, it's killing it because <laughs> that's all they're focusing on. They're focusing on that ROAS and they're wondering why they can't get it. So out. you brought up something there. What, rec what recommendations do you have for marketers who are out there trying to sell their strategy through to a CFO who's like, yeah, if you show me ROAS, it's good. I mean, marketers love ROAS, but accountants love it even more. And so if, what, do you, what, do you, what do you recommend to people who are like, hey, I know this works. I know it's working well. The numbers don't quite show it yet, but like have faith in me. I have trust in the process. Like, what do you recommend to people who are trying to say that to a CFO or accountants? It's like, sorry, I'm a numbers guy. That's it. That's a great question. <laughs> and that's, that's most of our job in marketing, right? Is, is selling the results, is selling results. Uh, a, a big part of that is preempting, right? So that not only do you, are you telling them what's going to happen? This is, we're going to spend this much. This is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to see. This is how it's going to be scary. This is what you're going to stay up at night on, but this is what we're watching. These are the numbers that we're watching. And we know as long as these are growing, that it's going to pan out in this way. So it, it's kind of becoming a, a little bit of a fortune teller, but based off of what we've all seen in our businesses, we can do that within a, within a pretty good, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a range, right? right? And so it's, it's really helping people, helping them to see what's going to happen so that when it does happen, you can say, I told you, I told you this would happen. Keep going. Well, I think part of it too is, is kind of grouping it and bucketing it, if you will, and, and not being afraid to say like, hey, this isn't going to drive as good results as the ROAS campaign. We know that. So don't expect that. But here's where it fits in the overall marketing plan. And here's what we're hoping it can do and, and so forth. And some of it is setting instead of ROAS numbers, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to set goals all the time. Some of it's setting a, a, a limit. Like, yeah. hey, we're not going to, it's going to go low. Here's the floor. We're not going to let it go below this, you know, and we'll be watching that. Yeah, that might be a good compromise too for the CFO. Like, hey, if the CPA gets above or whatever, if our objectives get below the certain amount, we'll, we'll, we'll stop the bleeding at that point. But yeah. great. We, so back to that question too, an example of it is, I don't know how many times we've had clients. There was one I was working with an e-commerce brand a month ago. And like clockwork, we had a paid search campaign that was going on. It was giving us about a four to five ROAS. And like clockwork, we would run a display campaign along the side. The ROAS would go up to seven. Like every single time it would make a two point jump. Now, we could never track the performance, like the, the display campaign would drive no ROAS. If we tracked that as a silo, it did nothing for us. And so when we go back to the client, they kept being like, okay, how much are we spending on display? What is the return on there? And it's like, well, not, it's not great if you silo it, but if you look at the impact it has on the paid search campaign, and they just couldn't, um, let's pause it. That's not working. Sure enough, the ROAS would drop back down. We turn it back on, the ROAS would pick back up, turn it off, it would drop back down. And so finally, we had enough correlation there to show them like, hey, don't look at it as just its own thing, because on its own, yeah, it's not doing a good enough job. But like you mentioned early on, if someone might see that and then remember, oh, I'm going to go search out that brand later, then when they go to Google, it's going to help improve things, right? But if you didn't have the impressions driving that awareness, it wouldn't, it, well, you wouldn't see the results you did too. So let's see what these questions we got. We got, might not, might not be able to get to all of them. I want to make sure we have time for a Q&A. Um, what do you find is the most impactful to drive market share growth as a category leader? What is the most impactful thing you can do to drive market share? I mean, we're talking a lot about marketing right now, but I honestly feel like the most impactful thing for anybody that's really leading out in a category is customer service. Um, 
it's always going to be how your customers feel about your product. And you can do all the marketing in the world, but if your customer service isn't the best in the world, you're not going to be a category leader. And um, it's, it's all about getting to what's, what's called net negative churn, where you don't, you're not losing customers, but your customers are always continually growing with you, where every month from month over month, if you had no new sales or no new impact, at least on the B2B side, that you're, you're getting to the point where your customers are continuing paying you more and more and more because they love your product so much. I would agree with the customer service and I'd also maybe expand it a little to include relationships in general. Um, where I work, sales prospecting and um, sales prospected deals and then strategic partnerships deals drive the most revenue revenue proportionally to anything else. Um, they're few and far between, but they kind of make up for it by just the quality. You know, they've become best friends with half the company in the course of their maybe year long journey to become a customer. And it's just always worth it. And the more big ones you bag, the more your credibility increases for all the smaller little guys you're going after as well. Jared? Yeah, I totally back that that up completely. I mean, we've heard, we've all heard holistic marketing. It's become a buzzword in the last couple of years, right? One of the main peers, those, those, those four peers of, of holistic marketing is relationship marketing. And I would say 100% relationship marketing. How are people feeling about your brand? Do they see you as a personality? Do they see you as a faceless corporation? Do they see you as somebody who actually cares about them? Do they see you as somebody who actually cares about the world that they want to live in? Um, helping people understand what you're for rather than just trying to climb in their wallet. Right. And, and that's that's a big, huge thing. I would say that's number one. I think I think with B2C, too, that's huge is, is more and more and more I see with brands is is the kind of community outreach. Right. What are you doing in the community? What is your what do you stand for? You know, what does your brand stand for? That kind of stuff. Uh, when, when to answer that question myself is one thing we always we I always talk about kind of goes back to like the days of college. Right. The, the marketing piece, product, price, place, promotion. Right. We're responsible more or less for the promotion side of it. So when I always look at it like, what are the things that have the category leaders? What are the things they can do? I always it comes back to me as the product, you know, whatever it is that you are selling, whatever it is, is it a good product? I have so many companies that come to us and they feel like if they can kind of have a cool looking packaging and a nice looking website and we can just throw this magic marketing at it, that they have a business overnight. And what's what I try to tell them is like, we can't create a business for you. We can help accelerate your business, but like you got to be priced right. You got to have a good product. You got to be able to get it out to customers. You, know, you got to place it right. You got to have good customer service. And then the promotion is definitely going to help. An holistic approach is definitely going to help for sure. But for me, it always comes back to you have a good product. Because if you have a good product, it'll help with customer service. If you have a crappy product, you better have a really good customer service team. For yeah. sure. But I would say that the, that that line for a good product is lower than you think. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Right? <laughs> I mean, you could take, I don't know, millions of brands like uh, uh, Tom Shoes. Let's take Tom Shoes. Oh, but nobody's a huge Tom Shoes fan. I love him as a brand, right? Great. Did very well and are doing well in the market. But their actual shoes, like, they're not not the best quality shoes, but hey, they do the one for one campaign where you buy some shoes, you give one to a family in need, like huge. That's cool. So I think you can, I think it can be lower, but the question is, is what are you actually selling? And I feel like a lot of brands get stuck in, hey, I'm selling this widget rather than I'm selling this, what somebody's actually buying. A, a good purpose. Example, like a purpose. Well, Tom's shoes is a perfect example that you're not necessarily buying it just for the best shoe. Like right. you're not getting a recommendation from your podiatrist to be like, hey, this is the best shoe to <laughs> yeah. wear. Yeah. But you're buying it because you want to show that, hey, I'm part of the community. Hey, that, you know, like it's who you are representing who you are. Yeah. Or somebody said at, at a convention that, that uh, we were at just last week or whatever, they said uh, they're a surf company and said, hey, we're not, we're not selling a surfboard and wetsuit and all the, all the surf gear that goes along with it. We're selling the ability to walk on water, you know, and, and understanding what they're actually selling, uh, I think is a big deal rather than just, Hey, we've got this cool widget and look at all the widgets inside this widget that make this right. widget really cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to do a Q and A at 1245. So we got a couple minutes left. We got time for two more questions. Where do you foresee the conversation of attribution and ROAS going in the future? What will be the key to marketers not only measuring success, but doing the right thing because, of the, because it is the right thing to do as a brand? So where do you foresee, let's maybe start with the first part of that question, like two in here. Where do you foresee the conversation of attribution and ROAS going in the future? 
I mean, I see, I'm seeing lots of different companies um, starting to try to solve attribution. Um, on the D2C side, especially consumer side, there's a really cool software called Rockerbox. Um, if you haven't looked at it, look at them. Um, they are starting to bring both offline and online attribution together. And so, so I see that, that becoming more of a thing where you're able to actually track what we're talking about. The ROAS versus non-ROAS versus like the offline events and online events where it's all the data is starting to come together. We haven't ever had that like fully, but I see it slowly coming together. Yeah, I think as people get more and more devices and we have more and more touch points, the stitching together of all of those touch points, whether it's a billboard or a Hulu ad or a digital marketing ad, they'll inevitably be stitched together. I mean, you see, I've seen Hulu ads with QR codes on them now. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, I know why that's happening. Um, and yeah, so I, Machines are getting smarter. We all know that. They're, we've got like a sentient AI from Google now. Yeah, didn't Google come exciting. out and say that? Yeah, something's yeah. thinking for itself now. Um, so, yeah, it's happening. Jared? Yeah. I think that's a great question because I see two almost conflicting uh, things that are happening, right? The push towards privacy, which is fantastic, and I think it's great for consumers. Although at the same time, you're seeing consumers even push back on that. I want my privacy, but at the same time, I don't want to be served stuff that I don't yeah, want, right? Yeah. So even even they they are fighting that back. And then you've got the desire for attribution or understanding those touch points. And I do think that it's going to come together in in some sort of head. That's and here's a plug for Max Connect. Even though I don't use, I'm not a user of your software. You uh, will be. It's called what's kudos. It kudos. Give credit where credit's due. But I think kudos is I think kudos is really future thinking when it comes to this because the ability to look at a single customer and see each one of their touch points along the way and to be able to see that and track that in real time, I think once we're able to see large groups and see what what's happening and be able to be completely nimble and moving uh, according to all those different touch points, but see the the true customer journey. I think that's where things are. Yeah, I mean, that, and that was the goal of, of why we built Kudos, right? I mean, for the longest time, we've used HubSpot, we've used Google Analytics and all these different things. And they always tracked things by like the marketing channel, right? They were focused on your marketing channel. Max Connect, we've always been focused on the customer. So we wanted to kind of flip it on its head and be like, hey, don't track the channel path, track the customer path and see how they touch points with it. To answer that question, I, I feel like where I see it going is, is a term that we kind of used to use all the time. We call it HI or human intelligence, right? Because I, I'm with you already that they're going to stitch together all these things and attribution is only going to get better and better and better. And the machine learning behind it, you know, the artificial intelligence behind it's going to get more smarter and more sophisticated. But we talked a lot about grouping those things, right? So a, a machine learning tool is only going to be as good as the rules and the data that you put into it. And so we always talked about human intelligence because we love AI tools. We love machine learning tools. They make our job easier. They make us more effective. But you still have to have a human behind there that's setting things up. It's analyzing that, right? It says, hey, this shouldn't go in the ROAS machine learning model, right? This should go in the add to cart. Well, this should go on the top of funnel. This should purely go into branding. Now, when you're in those, let's maybe track them all very granularly. And I think attribution is going to improve that so you can track things from, I always think, how do they track if you took a screenshot, send it to your wife and say, hey, buy this for me. You know, how are they tracking that kind of stuff? But they eventually will. But it's still going to take a smart marketer that sets up the architecture for it and analyzes it all together. And so it's something we always used to call human intelligence. I hope it goes that way. I hope AI doesn't fully take over. If it does, well, it's been a good run, everyone. So that's the 1245. Let's open it up to some Q&A so we can get out of here at the right time. Real quick before we answer that, on the audio, can we hear the audience or should we repeat the question? Yeah, so he's asking if I can uh, describe our add to cart campaign in a little more detail. Um, uh, as a whole, most, most campaigns are, have been turned on to conversion campaigns, right? They're just immediate purchase campaigns. So naturally, this is driving towards, uh, instead of a conversion result, it's an add to cart uh, result. And inside of that, we also have, uh, we also have website view, um, with certain ads that are turned on to website view results and certain ones that are turned on to click results, but it's all driving towards that add to cart group. And so what we're trying to do with that is serve up ads that are primarily introducing the company, getting people into that, into that add to cart so that once they're into that add to cart, we now have them 
and we can essentially buy a book of, of potential customers who a few months down the road, we can, for lack of a better term, push them over the edge to be customers, right? They're already there. They're already waiting and saying, hey, I'm, I'm interested enough that I came to your site. I checked you out. I even got as far as adding this sucker to a cart. I just, for some reason, didn't quite have the information I need or feel pushed enough to make that final, final purchase. And it has been that we've just been losing them. That, that group, if they, don't, if they don't make that conversion campaign, uh, Facebook or TikTok or Instagram is not, or Google is not, not even focusing on those people. It's going, oh, they're just add to Carter's. I'm aimed on the converters. And so it's losing all those people. And you go, whoa, that's a big group of people who really like us and are really close and wouldn't take much to become customers. Don't forget them. And so that's what we're doing is buying that book and spending uh, in, in our seasonality, um, really buying those so that once that season comes, we can really drive towards turning those people. And that, that's a perfect example of that, of that human intelligence affecting the machine learning, right? Because Facebook's machine learning is saying, hey, these people didn't purchase, so forget about them. It's like, well, hold on. Hold on. They're, They're good, good friends of ours. Yeah. Yeah. They're good people. Just I think also the biggest thing you got to do with what Jared's talking about is your content needs to be specific, right? We are. Yeah. So if you think about it as, as the algorithm, if it's, if it's speaking to converters, right. in a conversion campaign, it's speaking towards those immediate buyers. So just giving them a good deal or telling them a little bit about your product, they're going to be the ones to convert. Add to Carter's are thinking a little different, realizing that those people, if their behavior in the past tells Facebook, these are add to Carter's never converters, right. They're add to Carter's. That means they're thinkers. And that means that there's usually something that they're going to need a little extra push. It's not going to be just a big, good deal. It might be a, a great deal. It might be hitting them up with certain ones of your, your value propositions that you know they need to hear because they're not typically the people who just buy on a whim. They want to think about it a little bit more. So it's realizing the way that they think a little differently than the converters and trying to, to market towards them with your content. Any other questions? And from? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's it's interesting because it's not necessarily six to nine months just for those people, right? And it, even though we see the results happen that way, it's you're tracking the results along the way. Like even the add to cart campaign, for instance, uh, in there, there's people who are going to buy right away. They're, they might be add to carters and they might go, hey, I loved it. Or like a day later, or then they come into our funnel and we're hitting them up with email. We're hitting them up, we're retargeting them um, with additional value props. And they might, they might convert within seven, seven days, 14 days, 30 days, like the typical, the old Facebook algorithm or the old social algorithms, old Google algorithm. Um, so they might still convert, but along that, it's interesting to see that they kind of trickle in and it really does take about six months for the whole bulk to kind of, kind of snowball so it's like it's like you see this trickling grow and grow and grow until finally it overcomes the initial investment and then it just grows and grows past that so it's not necessarily the same same people it's kind of more thinking looking at it at a, as a as a budgetary role as and jerry brings up a good point something that we always try to stress to clients i was meeting with someone the other day talking about them is the importance of like an architecture behind your data, right? Because I always talk about if data is the most valuable resource there is now, it's more valuable than oil. Well, you wanna mine it and you wanna like silo it in the right way, right? So some of these people who are cart abandoners, it might not be anyone who has abandoned cart from zero days to 180. You might wanna be like, hey, I'm gonna do from 90 to 180, right? Maybe bid lower for these people. They're not as warm, but maybe we'll change a content strategy for them, try to reintroduce the brand to them or whatever it is. But that data is so valuable. So it's like, even if they didn't purchase and it's been a while, well, don't forget about them, utilize them in a different way. Yeah, uh, well, there's some things along inside there that I should probably mention too, where that add to cart gets smarter and smarter as it goes along, right? So you're gonna see those add to carts go up and up and up each month. You know, what maybe 2,000 or 3,000 one month, next month could be four, six, nine, 12, right? Just keeps going up. Um, but the other thing that you're going to see inside of that is that those people, as they, uh, not only is the algorithm getting smarter, but it's also, uh, how do I say this? I just lost my train of thought. Um, I might have to come back to it. You're good. Yeah. 
I lost where I was going. Questions, you're good. Yeah. Um, right here in the blue shirt. Oh, then, I was good. I just remembered. Okay. But Jared, so, finish. <laughs> no, so along with that, you're also getting a whole group of people that you can then run lookalike audiences to. You can see what they're running as well. And you start driving that. And, and then as those people grow and grow and grow, that's when those numbers, even though it's scary at first, as they get higher and higher, the more percentage of them start to buy eventually and eventually. And so it takes six to nine months to kind of grow that list to enough of a, a percentage that now it's overcoming any sort of input that you have in there. It's like, and the CFO goes, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah God, I trusted you. Right. I knew it all along. Yeah. <laughs> blue shirt. And then the one in the back is that teal blue. Sorry. You. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe I am too. I don't know. Attorneys going into Filevine, I knew this is going to be the hardest audience ever. Um, they're not the most quick to technology. Um, so I, I sometimes I joke about like, we should go to trade shows and teach people how to like search for case management software because search volume there is super, super low. Um, we use an ABM strategy. We're building that out right now. Um, uh, we do a lot of competitor conquest campaigns, so we'll bid on our competitors terms using dynamic keyword insertion because they're lawyers too, so they'll send us those cease and desist letters really quickly. Um, and those are our two biggest ways to go about it. We go to a lot of trade shows, and then um, these trade shows are very specific to the attorneys that we're targeting, so we're getting attendee lists filled with their contact information. Um, then we email them. And in all B2B, you're going to do all that kind of stuff. But in healthcare, accounting, legal, all those like specialized verticals, go to where they're at, go to the associations, go to their partners. Um, um, I'm huge into like partner relationships and association because you know that's your target market. And, and so like wherever I go, I want to find two or three associations and then go as far into those associations as possible um, if you're in a category that has a specialized like, like vertical market. I mean, ABM is a great way to do that. Account-based marketing strategy is big. One way we do it too digitally is through geofencing, right? So Eric mentioned, find them where they're at. Well, where are lawyers? They're working, they're at their office, right? So we do a lot of geofencing for B2B campaigns like this, where it's like, find where these like different law offices are that you wanna target. Let's set up a geofence around them and let's just hit those people, whatever devices they're on, whatever they might be doing, and just try to start getting a soft introduction to them. To them, when the emails come through, when you see them at trade shows, things like that, they've seen the brand before. We have, we have a question in the back. Great question. So he said, we've been talking a lot, a lot about attribution. How do you build an attribution model that's effective enough that your upper management won't just throw it out? This is super hard, guys. Um, the, I mean, you have to do a, a first um, touch approach. You have to do a last touch approach. You have to do a multi-touch approach. You have to do all of it. And, and, that's, and that's the thing is that you have to have all of those things that you can present. Okay, this is how it looks from a first touch attribution approach. And this is how it looks from a last touch, but this is how it looks from a multi-touch. So that way you can see the entire customer journey on what happened. And, and so you have to look at it from every perspective and then share each of those with um, as many people as you can, the sales team, the executive team, the CS team, just everyone so that everyone's on the same page that, hey, this is what is, happening. This is what is actually impactful. This is what, what is actually driving revenue. These are the things that are, are helping our brand growth. And, and so that answering that question is you have to do it all. So. And I, I think what gets hard too, is what Eric mentioned too, is it's like you're, the model will change completely when you change first click attribution versus last click attribution versus multi-touch, right? It'll completely change the effectiveness of the campaign. You're like, well, how does that work? Right? I would say the number one biggest takeaway is like how to set up an attribution model. And Eric mentioned this early, early on, but is with a very, very granular UTM tagging structure, right? Whether it's in the analytics or in the HubSpot or whatever your source of truth is, but it's just setting up that plan, that architecture very, very comprehensively and then tracking it and then optimizing it based on that is what we found to be the best. And then take all that information, all everything that Eric talked about, put your marketer hat on and decide what the plan should be and try to sell it through.
Yeah, go ahead, on the front here. Um, impression. So question is, what's the value of impression tracking um, versus like UTM tracking? Um, it's not just UTM only, um, it's doing both because you're going to have your social um, that is going to be very heavy on impression and engagement um, tracking because you're not going to um, necessarily have um, specific UTMs that people are maybe clicking on. Um, maybe it's likes, maybe um, different things like that. And so you've got to track those top of funnel, like social activities. Um, but every single campaign that you can track with UTM, you need to track with UTM. And I would say in addition to, I would use any sort of pixels and stuff you could to track view through conversions and things like that. We found view through conversions though with both Google and Facebook to be so wildly off to be honest, like you'll go in there and you'll be like, oh, it showed 700 purchases. You're like, well, there was 50. So I don't know how that would work, right? And you're like, sometimes the view tracking with Google is off. That's why it's like, I like to utilize UTM tagging more often, but still, I'm still gonna, we're still gonna set up pixel tracking with every vendor, every platform, everything we work to try to track all that stuff too. There was one more in the back, I thought, right here, yeah. So the question was, if you have a strong ROAS campaign, can you wait to do non-ROAS campaigns? I mean, I would say no. I, I mean, would we can totally see, say no. Yeah. We can see that with Artie like in, in her experience, but I've had the same experience. My, I mean, my last company I was at, um, we built a system called Merple, marketing revenue per lead, where it identified the campaigns that had the highest ROAS. And what did we do? Even, I mean, we were working on with Max Connect at the same time too, and they would tell us, don't do this, but we did it anyway. And, um, um, and we pushed really heavy into those ROAS ca campaigns and, and, and it works, but it also only works for a, um, a short period of time, is, um, maybe six months, a year, whatever, but it's not gonna, if you're, it's not gonna work long-term because you're only gonna get so much, so much out of the, each of those campaigns where you're not building your brand and you're not building everything you need to with those non robots campaigns about becoming a true thought leader in the industry. And so um, that's the differentiator from a good company and a great company. A great company will do both. Yeah, and I think I, think I would maximize them for sure. I mean, obviously if you have a good, performing ROAS campaign, we'll take advantage of it. But the problem is, and this analogy doesn't work nowadays because the market's so weird, but we used to always talk about, it's like only ROAS campaigns are kind of like renting, right? Yeah, it might be good short-term, but like it's make the investment in your company to buy a home, right? For the long-term of it. And so I think you got to do both. It's like maximize your, your ROAS campaigns for sure, but that's going to drive revenue for you, but that's not going to build your business, right? You want to build it up to where you have a customer base that's the ROAS is infinity because they're just seeking you out to buy from you and you're not even having to use any sort of paid media around it. But that also means that, that, that that's easy to say with an infinite budget, right? But if you have a finite amount of budget, where do you put it? So any other questions? Right here. What are the top questions that you use attribution to try to answer? So the question was, what are the top questions we use attribution to try to answer? So one of my favorite questions is the campaign influence question. And that's, you know, maybe not your last touch campaigns because people come in multiple times, most likely, before they take the action you want them to. <laughs> um, um, and so what we did was we stamp every interaction on the contact record in Salesforce, and then we can pull a report on like, oh, this campaign influenced this funnel stage this many times and influenced this much revenue. Um, and that's been one of our favorite things that we've drawn out. And it kind of, it plays almost like a political role in your organization too, because then it makes sure that every little marketing department is getting credit and measured somewhere and it keeps everybody a lot happier. Yeah, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's taking off the, the glasses of just sales and putting on a holistic view, right? Because if it's just sales, there's a lot of things you could probably do in your business that would get a whole ton of sales today, but might kill your business tomorrow, right? There's a whole lot of things. Like we all know how to go get sales, 
But at the end of the day, is it good for the business in the long term? And is it? And so in that case, what I'm doing is I'm constantly looking at the numbers to see if the behavior is going the way that I want it to go or think it should go. One of the things that we constantly say on our team is that everybody's used this. It's the 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 statement by Henry Ford, right? If I if I gave the people what they were asking for, I would have given them a faster horse. Faster horse, yeah. <laughs> right. And we've all kind of heard that statement, but it's, but it's true. We've got to be looking at attribution and looking at these numbers through our marketing lens. Is it is the, the behavior happening that we want to happen? And that may be in trademark term impressions. Are they looking for me? Are they talking about me? It may be in your, your organic search. Are people actually putting us in? It may be in just website clicks. Are people checking us out? Are they coming to even look? It may be in your email campaigns. And are they actually clicking through on your email campaigns? But looking at all those holistically to say, what is the behavior that this is showing me rather than I'm just a slave to whatever's going to make the sales be the highest right now? Because that may not be good for your business long-term. Yeah, and, and I would say specifically, like to answer your question, like I, we use it a lot to determine like what audiences are better than other. Let's say we're selling a product and we have three different audiences we wanna go after, right? Within a specific channel, we might use attribution to tell us so which one of those audiences resonated the most. We also use attribution a lot to answer questions about creative. Right? We might run for a car dealer, we might run a campaign for a lease offer and an MSRP off, and we'll run it to the same audience and we'll let attribution tell us what had a better conversion rate. Right? If, if it converted higher from the lease payments, well, maybe we should leverage that and utilize lease payments more often. But you absolutely have to have a holistic approach, but we can use attribution to answer specific questions about creative or audiences or messaging, things like that, that then we can employ on the holistic approach for our marketing and that's where that's such a brilliant approach too is being able to test in that in that small way to see what creative is performing and it may be it may be the one is performing really well with sales and maybe one is performing really well with add to carts and maybe one is performing really well with just getting them to the camp to the, the website and trying to figure out what is that doing and what do i need to then dial in because you may look at one and go hey that did not perform well on sales but it's not a throwaway there may be something in there that we can really like uh, build upon if we're looking at it in the right way and go, wait, let's switch up this campaign. Let's maybe change up the landing page it's going to, to drive, you know, there's, there's different Absolutely. ways to look at it and say, boom, that's, well, that's worthwhile. And it's funny because I always think, especially with, with the brands and companies who have a big like traditional media footprint, right? If they're doing a big outdoor campaigns or big TV campaigns or radio or whatever it is, I always laugh. I'm like, use, use some digital marketing to be your market research. Right before you go out and say this is what the billboard is, this is what the video, the creative is on the big TV campaign on the Super Bowl. It is. We'll run a little pre-roll campaign. Run with four different messages to your audiences. Which has a better view rate? Well, maybe then you should take that and utilize it for your ten million dollar TV buy. Like use five grand of market research to maximize your ten million. I don't know. Yeah, we'll do things like that, like audience farming. We're doing that right now with, you know, we sell keto meal replacement shakes, but we find that we're performing well among um, truckers. Yeah. And so we said, okay, well, how do we speak more to truckers? We're just catching some accidentally. So we did exactly what you're talking about and created several, several groups of ad sets and then started kicking them out. And we, and we're testing just the audience. Okay. First of all, does this perform to trucker uh, occupation? Yeah. Does it perform with trucker interest? Does it perform with wife of trucker? I like, <laughs> like yeah. there's all sorts of ways you can kind of dial in and go wait a minute like actually we found the best way is family members of truckers they seem to be buying the food for those truckers on the road I see that. and it's performing really well there and we go oh okay so we learned something about those audiences and what creative to perform and we can switch up to creative and go oh we're actually speaking to the families not necessarily the truckers themselves so but just taking small amounts of money and really audience farming figuring out what creative is going to perform and what audience and getting really granular so you can test and know where to go Anyone else? I think, we're, I think we're about done on time. Well, I think that's what we got in time. We'll turn it back over to these guys, but I want to thank all of you guys for coming up here on this panel with me. It's been great chatting with you guys and hope it was informal for all of you guys here and those that are watching online. So thank you.